<clears throat> I don't know if you believe this or not, but one of the hardest things in the world in the morning time is to arise. I don't know if that is with you or not, but especially if you're in between the ages of 5 and 18, it's really hard to get up in the morning. And the reason why is because there's really nothing good to look forward to. You know, when you're between those ages, there's nothing good to look forward to except that of school. And school helps us to learn many things, but one of the best things it teaches us is morning discipline. Can I get a witness on that? Amen. It teaches us to be disciplined with our day, disciplined with our morning. Now, as we have been going to online school and school at home, I don't know how that's going to work in the next few years. It might be that we learn to sleep in all the time. Uh, but one of the good things about school is morning discipline. How many has ever had a child that was hard to get up in the morning? Anybody have a child that was hard to get up in the morning? Okay. Okay, so we understand what that's about. Uh, it begins with a knock on the door, doesn't it? And then you walk away from the door and uh, you just gently say, you know, it's time to get up. But then after a little while, you hear no rustling, you hear nothing going on. And so you say, wake up, we only got 15 minutes left, you know. And then you go back to the door in about five minutes and you put your ear to the door, don't you? And you hear nothing in there. So you barge in, you rip the covers back, and then you begin to threaten with cold water. You know, has anybody ever had to resort to cold water? Anybody ever had to resort to cold water? We have a couple who has had to resort to cold water. Well, sometimes those hardships, those troubles of adolescence even moves into our adult stages, don't it? Because if it's one thing to get up for, work, or for school, it's also another hard thing to get up for work sometimes. Uh, I like what one man said. Uh, he was a husband. He said, sometimes I wake up grumpy in the morning and sometimes I let her sleep in. Uh, I, anybody can relate to that one? Because there is this draw to the bed. There is this draw to the night. Uh, we enjoy the darkness of the room because the light of day uh, kind of blinds us. And we enjoy the warmth of the covers because the air around us is cold and is chilly. Uh, we enjoy the warmth of the covers. We enjoy the rest and we dread the work that we know is coming. And in case I have lost some of you along the way, I have already just moments ago made the transition from physical to spiritual. Now, I've already made the transition from that of our desire and our fleshly lust for that of that is spiritual in, in darkness. Can I say there are a, a, a thing about our flesh that desires to muddle in sin? Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Uh, we desire the darkness. Why? Because that is where we're from. That is who we are. And I don't care how holy or religious you are. I don't care how many times that you've read your Bible through in the course of one year. I don't care how much you pray. You always have this thing on the inside of you. It is called the flesh. And you contend with it because it likes darkness rather than the light. Not only do we not like the light of the blinding sun in our eyes, but we also really pretty much enjoy uh, the, the, the warmth of comfortability instead of the coldness of, of our work. Can I say, though, this world is becoming a very cold and heartless place. It's become a very wicked place. And I see the darker that it gets, I believe also the colder that it gets and we have arisen today, and may I say to you, I believe the days of comfortable Christianity are days long gone by. The days of easy Christian living have officially become the days of the past. The darkness around us is getting darker. That coldness of the world and their involvement in wickedness is getting colder. The rest that the church has seen in days gone by are, is, is long gone by. And I believe it's now time to get up for, for the work. I mean, I say that to say this. It's time for the church to arise. It's time for God's children to arise and be part of this last day as we see this spiritual wake-up call around us. And then in our text today, we will narrow in on five words that Jesus 
will say to his disciples. I want you to look with Matthew chapter number 17. Look with me if you would in verse number 1. The Bible says, And after six days Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John his brother, and bringeth them up into an high mountain apart, and was transfigured before them, and his face did shine as the sun. And his raiment was white as the light. And behold, there appeared unto him Moses and Elias talking with him. Then Peter answered and said unto Jesus, Lord, is it good for us, it is good for us to be here, if thou wilt let us make here three tabernacles, one for thee, one for Moses, and one for Elias. While he yet spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and behold, a voice out of the cloud which said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. And when the disciples heard it, they fell on their face and were sore afraid. And Jesus came and touched them and said, Arise and be not afraid. Amen. This morning I want, to help, or I want to preach with the help of the Lord this thought, Arise and be not afraid. Amen. Arise. And be not afraid. Lord, we love you. Oh, God, we're thankful. God, I'm thankful that we can take the word of God. And Lord, it is ever more current than the morning's newspaper. God, I'm thankful that this word that is the old book is still the new word. And God, I pray, Lord, that you'd speak to us in a very powerful way today. God, just like you spoke to your disciples that day, God, I pray that you would help us to arise and be not afraid. God, we love you. God, we're thankful for you. Now we ask, God, that you would go with us through the remainder of this service. And God, we ask that the word of God would fall on every heart and that every heart would receive it gladly. For it's in the name of Jesus that we do pray. Amen and amen. The Bible is filled with the word arise. It is one of God's commandments that he uses very, very frequently. God told Abraham to arise and go to a land that I will show thee of. God told Lot to arise and flee the city. God told Jacob to arise and go up to Bethel. God told Moses to arise and get down to the people. It was God that told Joshua to arise and go over this Jordan. God told Gideon to arise, for I have given you the victory. And God told Samuel to arise and anoint that young man named David as king over all of Israel. God told Elijah to arise and go down to the widow at Zarephath's house, for she will sustain thee. It was God that told Jeremiah to go up. Uh, he said, arise and go down to the potter's house and there learn of me. It was God that told Ezekiel to rise and to hear the voice of God. God called Jonah to arise. God called Micah to arise. God called Habakkuk to arise. God called Joseph to arise. God called Philip to arise. God called Peter to arise. God called Paul to arise. In the earthly ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ, it was one of the words that he used often as well. Being the very Son of God, being the very Word of God, he used it very frequently. Jesus, time and time again, would look at someone who was hurting. He would look at someone who was wounded. He would look at someone who was crippled. Listen to this one. He would look at someone who was comfortable. He would look at someone who was dead. And he would look at them and he would say these words, Arise, my child. Arise. Then Christ Himself would march up Calvary's hill. He would take upon Himself those rusty nails and be nailed to a cross. And there He would cry, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which is to say, My God, my God, why hast Thou forsaken me? And He would die upon that cross, shedding His blood. They would take that lifeless body and they would lay it into a borrowed tomb and seal fast the door. But I'm going to tell you what happened three days later. The sweet Holy Spirit of God came down to that tomb tomb. He didn't have to use the door. He came on in. And he, with the words of God, said to that body, Arise, my son. Arise. 
And after three days of death, that blood began to pump through his veins again. After three days of death, that heart began to beat again. After three days of death, those eyes opened up again. And he came out with that grave with power. Why? Because he obeyed the commandment to arise, arise, arise. And through the Bible, God will command someone to arise And this morning, I believe with all of my heart, God is looking at His children in this day. And He is saying, I want you to go back to the passage in Matthew chapter number 17. And just as I spoke to the church in that day, just as I spoke to these disciples that day, I'm here to speak to you once again. And that is this message, arise and be not afraid. In our text, God will speak to His disciples and He tells them to arise. And they had just had something that had frightened them. They had just seen something that changed them, changed the world. They had just seen something that shocked them to their core. And here they are trembling upon the ground with their face to the ground. And the voice of a loving God comes to them and touches them and says unto them, Rise and be not afraid. And as we have come into a day that is shocking us, as we have come to a day that is frightening many. Uh, We need more than ever the touch of a holy hand from heaven. Uh, We need the precious word speaking to every heart today. The same words, arise and be not afraid. Now I want us to see why the Lord called them to arise. You say, Brother Tommy, are we to arise as the church and take up arms? Are we to arise and take our country back? Well, the Bible will tell us here what we are need to arise for. God will tell us Jesus Christ will be talking to His disciples in this day as talking to His disciples in our day will tell us the need for us to rise. Number one, I want you to notice this truth. Arise. There is someone we must see. Arise. Because there is someone we must see. When you look at our text in verse number 7, Jesus came to them and touched them and said, Arise and be not afraid. And I want you to look at the very next verse. What happens? What changes? What is it that they come to immediately after getting up? The Bible says in verse number 8, And when they had lifted up their eyes, when they arose, they saw no man save Jesus only. I'm going to tell you, we need to arise today and get our eyes off of everything that is troubling us, everything that is shocking us, everything that is making us tremble and angered. May I say, we need to get our eyes higher than that. We need to get above the horizon of this earth and see God for who He really is. We need to see Jesus this morning. My friend, you say, but tell me, have you ever seen Him? I've seen Him a thousand times with the eye of faith. And I've never seen him with my physical eye, but I've seen the Lord a thousand times in situations. Every time we come to something hard, Jesus shows up. And he pulls us through. He carries us through. He pushes us through. Oh my, he is here. The Bible tells us in verse number 2 that these disciples were on this mount and this transfiguration was before them. Look at verse number 2. The Bible says... And he is, speaking of Jesus, his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as the light. In verse number 2, they are smitten with this Jesus. In verse number 2, they look at this man in his eyes. His face is shining like the sun, and his garment is shining like a bright light. They are taken by who he is and what he is. His robe of flesh has been uh, shed from him, and he is transfigured before them as he was before he stepped into that baby's clothing as a, in that manger that day. He is standing before them, not as Jesus, uh, the Son of earth, but Jesus, the Son of God. And he is shining in his brightness, and they are taken by that. But I want you to notice what happens in verse number three. Would you notice what happens? They are smitten by Jesus, they are focused on Jesus, but something happens in verse three. Look at what happens. And behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus. May I say to you, 
What happens in verse number 3 is they take their eyes off the shining Jesus. They remove their eyes from the face that shineth like the sun. They remove their eyes from the garment that shineth like the light. And they begin to focus on Moses. They begin to focus on Elijah. And because their eyes got away from looking at Jesus, their motive got off course. Will you notice what Peter says? Here's what Peter says. God, it is good for us to be here. Let us build a tabernacle. Three of them. One for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. Can I say how careless that was of Peter? Why? Because he is wanting to build a shrine to Moses. He's wanting to build a shrine to Elijah. He's wanting to set up worship to these men just as long as he can also God. He was putting men on the same level as God. And I want to tell you how sad it is that we've come to the same predicament in our day. We've gotten our eyes off the King of kings and Lord of lords. We begin to put them on men and parties And we're beginning in our mind to set up men that needs to be as worshipped as God. You say, Brother Tommy, I've never worshipped a man. Listen, if you speak his name a whole lot more than you speak the Lord's name, I'm going to tell you it seems kind of suspicious. And they are on this mountain. They are seeing Jesus transform before them. But they got their eyes on men. And they wanted to set up a shrine of worship. Tabernacles for Moses and Elijah. What happens? What happens at that point? Peter, you know, the spokesman of the group, he says, Lord, it's good for us to be here. Uh, We think we need to set up three tabernacles, one for you, but also one for Elijah and one for for Moses. What happens? Look with me, if you would, in verse number 5. And while he yet spake. Listen, did God give him time to finish? No, sorry, Bob, he didn't. No way. He didn't give him any time to finish. And while he yet spake, listen what happens. The Bible says a bright cloud overshadowed them and behold a voice out of the clouds which said, This is my beloved son, not Moses, not Elijah. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. What happens? God just rebuked the daylights out of them. And what happens? Well, they fall on their face. This isn't a time of worship and celebration anymore. This is a time to duck. Amen. They get on their face before God. And they there are trembling in fear. God has rebuked them. Listen, God forced their eyes off of Moses. God forced their eyes off of Elijah. God forced their eyes off of men. To put it back on a son. When Jesus says to them, arise and be not afraid. Verse number 8 tells us. They lifted themselves up. And they saw no man. Save Jesus. And the reason is because God was rebuking them for getting their eyes off Christ. Think, think about the blessing of the transfiguration. Think about the blessing of what they saw and experienced that day. And guess what happened? While Peter was talking, God yanked, ripped that blessing away from them because they got their eyes off Jesus onto lesser things. Have you ever considered that the blessings of America are contingent upon the church's vision? Have you ever thought that the blessings of America were contingent upon where the children's of God's eyes are looking. There is a day we used to be smitten with God. There was a day when we used to be not filled with distractions, but we were filled with the desiring to meet with Jesus on a daily basis. There used to be a day when these distractions we could push back, but these distractions now have come and dragged our eyes off of seeing the Lord. And we begin to lift up man and we begin to think about man as the solution to our problem. I wonder how long they would have seen the glory of the Lord if they had just kept their eyes on Jesus. Uh, but it was taken away from them. This good thing was taken away from them. This blessing was taken away from them because they got their eyes in the wrong place. And I wonder how long America could have lasted if we had kept our eyes on Jesus. I'm going to tell you what happened. 
59 years ago, we kicked God out of schools. 59 years ago, we kicked prayer out of schools. 59 years ago, we kicked the Ten Commandments out of schools and courthouses, federal buildings. And what great, what, what this nation risen to the most powerful nation in all the world, the most good giving nation in all the world, because they had their focus on God now in a short 59 years is beginning to crumble all around you and all around me. And I'm here to tell you, the answer is not in Washington. The answer is not with a man. The answer is not with a party. The answer is when we get our eyes focused back on God. Oh, God. We've glorified a lot of things in our life at the sacrifice of glorifying Jesus. And sometimes God will remove things from his children if they get between him and God. Our only hope is not in Republicans, Democrats, or America, or free speech. Our only hope is in seeing Jesus. He says, arise. and Be not afraid, because there's someone you must see. Secondly, I want you to notice, arise, there is something we must share. There is something we must share. I want you to look at verse number 9. The Bible says, And as they came down from the mountain, Jesus charged them, saying, And tell the vision to no man, until the Son of Man be risen again from the dead. And the disciples have received this powerful message. Think about what they've seen. They've seen God in all of His glory. They've seen Jesus Christ with His robe of flesh taken away. And they've seen Him in spirit. Uh, they have seen Him as the very Son of God with a, uh, uh, the robe from heaven. And they have heard the voice of heaven telling them that Jesus, this is His Son. That Jesus is the way. That Jesus is the truth. That Jesus is the life. And in our text, what happens is Jesus puts a muzzle right over their mouth. He says, tell this to no man. Has anybody ever had to be muzzled? <laughs> Woo. The day I said I do. <laughs> oh, Lord, that's out on Facebook. I'm kidding. How many's mother ever had to muzzle them? Does your mama ever have to muzzle you? I can, anybody ever remember that hand coming over your mouth? Covering your mouth? How many wives ever had to muzzle them? They don't use a hand, they use an eyeball. You ever been muzzled by an eyeball? How many children ever had to muzzle them? They tug on your shirt or pull on your arm a little bit, and what they're saying is don't open your mouth. Don't say that, please, please. In our text, Jesus puts his hand over their mouth. Jesus gives them an eye. He tugs on their arm. He says, tell this to no man. But then Jesus tells a wonderful word. It's a five-letter word. It's not very big, but it's really important. It starts with un and ends with teal. The word is... Until. He says, don't tell what you've seen. Don't tell the power of what you've experienced. Don't say what you heard. Don't go down here telling everybody what you've experienced this day. Until the Son of Man be lifted from the grave. Let me ask you a question. Did Jesus die? I'm going get, to get an amen or a yes out of you, okay? Did Jesus die? Did Jesus uh, bury in a borrowed tomb? Did Jesus raise again from the dead? Amen. Amen. And that tells us that it is our job. There is something that we must share. There's a story we must tell. There's an experience that's happened in our soul that we must share with all the world. And that is Jesus is the way. Jesus is the truth. Jesus is the life. That God from heaven still says, that is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Look at him. Hear ye him. 
We find here that God is telling us, giving us something to do. He is saying, arise, because there is a message to share. And I'm here to tell you, the greatest message you've ever come out of your mouth is not from Washington, it's from heaven. The greatest story you've ever tell will not be from a book, it is from the book. The greatest message you will ever share is the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you don't, men's men's bloods will be on your hands at that great white throne judgment. The Bible tells us that we'll stand there at the great white throne judgment and everyone who was lost will pass before us. And they will be judged for their iniquity. They will be judged for their sin. Their hands will be bound fast. And then they will be thrown into the lake of fire. But every person that walks that aisle, they bow before the Lord. They they honor Him as King of kings and Lord of lords. But they, because they have never received Christ as their Savior, then are bound hand and foot and cast in the lake of fire. The Bible says that everyone that you had a chance to witness to, everyone that you had a chance to give a track to, everyone that you had a chance to be able to tell the precious story of Jesus to, their blood will I require at thine hand. And I'm here to tell you this morning, oh, there is something we must share. May we arise this morning and not only look to Jesus, but may we arise that we might share the message of God. The Lord loves them. God came and died for their sins. God rose again over death and hell and the grave that they might have life everlasting. And the Bible tells us if we will call upon the name of the Lord, believing in Him by faith, thou shalt be saved. Arise, because there's something we must share with the world. Number three, I want you to notice, we to arise, there is something we must understand. There's something we must understand. I want you to look at verse number 10. The Bible says in verse number 10, And his disciples asked him, saying, Why then say the scribes that Elias must first come? These are the first words that come out of the disciples' mouth after seeing the transfiguration of the Lord. The very first word is what? Why? 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 That was the question upon the disciples' heart. They misunderstood the news that was surrounding them in their day. Here's what they say. Why? The the scribes are pushing some news. The the scribes are on every media broadcast. The scribes are sending out this news that is saying that uh, Jesus is not the Messiah because uh, Elias has not first come. We know in the Old Testament that Elias must first come. Oh, breaking news, breaking news. John the Baptist just said that he wasn't Elijah. So that means that this is not God. Christ is not God. What was they pushing? A false narrative. They were pushing, the scribes were pushing, this can't be the Christ because Elijah has not first come. And this was the question that was making them ponder. Jesus had already called them. Jesus has shown himself many times. But the first thing upon their heart and out of their heart and to their mouth was, why does the scribes then say that Elias must first come? What they had been pondering is, is Christ really the Messiah? That's what they were pondering. Why? Because all the news around them was telling them that this wasn't Jesus. And they were confused. They didn't understand Jesus never addresses the false narrative to the world. He never goes out and rebukes CNN. But what he does is he simply tells his disciples in verse number 11, verse number 12, that Elias has come and that Elias is John the Baptist. Look at what they say in verse number 13. Then the disciples, what? Understood. (laughs) Ain't that something? Now, if the news makes you want to spit nails and rise up arms, can I say you're falling into the devil's same trap? You're falling into the same, same trap that these disciples had fallen in. The more I watch the news, which is very little, and on the very slight occasion I wonder on a social media side, the more I see Ephesians chapter number 6, verse number 12, in actuality. 
What does the Bible say in Ephesians chapter number 6, verse number 12, Brother Tommy? It says these words. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual witness in high places. Listen, the people you're seeing on the television isn't your enemy. Listen, the people on social media websites are not your enemy. Who is? That one, like a witch over a cauldron, who is stirring in his place that the Antichrist might come. That one who is Satan is your enemies. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. Quit thinking about punching that guy in the face. Can I get an amen right there? Quit thinking about punching that guy in the face. Quit thinking about sparing all kinds of news about this other person. Listen, that ain't your battle. Your battle is higher than that. Your battle ain't no, uh, with flesh and blood. You're fighting against spiritual wickedness in high places. And the only thing that can uh, come against spiritual wickedness is the blood and message of Jesus Christ. Friend, the more we come into this latter day, may we lift up the name of Jesus. There's something we must understand. What is it, Brother Tommy? This world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The Lord is beckoning me from heaven's open doors. And I can't feel at home in this world anymore. How many can't feel at home in this world anymore? I want to tell you. You're in a good spot. There's something we must understand. Lastly, there's something that we must do. Arise! There is something we must do. Look with me in verse number 14. And when they were come to the multitude, as to say, once they got off the mountain, once they got off this blessing, once it was ripped away from them, as soon as they came off this mountain, the Bible says, And when they were come to the multitude, they came to him, a certain man, kneeling down to him and saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is a lunatic and sore vexed. For oft he falleth into the fire and oft into the water. And I brought him to thy disciples. And listen, they could not cure him. There's something we must do, but here's what the disciples found in that day. They didn't have the power to cure it. They didn't have it. They didn't have the answers. They're coming, people's coming to them and say, we're trying, but we, we can't. And Jesus will rebuke them. Here's what he'll say. He says this to his own people. How oft shall I be with you? How long should I tarry with you? And they ask him after the Lord heals them in verse number 15, in verse number 19. They ask him in verse number 19, why couldn't we cast this, this, this devil out? And verse number 20 tells the tale. What does Jesus say? Because of your what? Unbelief. There's something we must do. We must help the nations, but the only way that we're going to do it is by faith. I want to remind you of two mountains. On one mountain stood the Philistine army. On another mountain, there stood the, the armies of all Israel. And Israel was shaken and stirred by what they were seeing. They were in fear from the Philistine army. And every day at morning, night, at morning noon, and night, this Philistine, a man named Goliath, a giant above all else, would come down into that valley and he would say unto the, all of Israel, pick you a man, any man, and you come down and fight with me and the winner of that victory, the opposing army will serve them. And I'm going to tell you what it did. It made them fearful. Oh, it angered them. But they had not faith. Why? Because they saw the chaos and calamity and was feared. But then there comes this little boy. Do you see him? He rides up in this little bitty cart, I believe, little bitty cart. He don't have a clue, you know. He's not been educated beyond knowledge, you know what I'm saying? 
He rides up in this little cart. What's in his cart? Anybody know? Lunch. What is it? Cheese and bread. Crackers. Some kind of bread. Man, this is the delivery boy. He gets out of his cart. And about that time, he steps up to that line, giving out the cheese with a big smile on his face. <laughs> and then he looks down in that valley and he sees that, that giant. And he hears them. He hears him defy the armies of the living God. What does that boy say? Hold me back. I'm going down to the valley. He goes down with a sling and a stone. Why? Not because of his ability. Why? Because of his faith. We're not to rise up arms. We're to rise up a message. We're not to fight against men, flesh and blood. Oh, we got a higher battle than that. Let's war against the devil. How? There's something we must do. Let's push, promote the gospel of Jesus Christ. How many would arise with me this morning?